right, let's go ahead and uh, get started this evening. So if you've got your Bibles, you can go ahead and turn to Exodus 19. So we'll be right there. I want to recap 18 real quick. But excited about it. If you're joining us online, we're glad to have you. If you hit that share button on Facebook or on YouTube, let's find out about our channel. But we are like finally here at Exodus 19. And uh, we're going to be, as I said last week, we'll be camping out for a while. And that was uh, a play on words, of course. So the, I'll get into that here in a minute. Uh, but just an amazing, we're, you know, the scripture always, of course, is amazing. But we're about to start the law, the giving of the law, and we're going to be there for a long time. So just some things that the Lord's going to, going to give and work through. So I'm excited about that. But just to recap last week, in chapter 18, we talked about Jethro's advice to Moses. And we really went back, and there's this little bit of a gap filled in. Jethro, which is Moses' Moses's father-in-law, brings his wife and children to Moses in the wilderness. So we didn't really know that his wife and children had left, his two sons, but they get brought back to Moses. Uh, the Bible says that Jethro had heard, heard all that, the, that God had done for Moses and Israel. And what happens is Jethro, he's a priest, he's a Midianite priest, so he's a pagan priest. And we see that he begins and, and actually starts and does believe in God. He, he declares that the God of Israel is the true living God. And then he gives Moses this advice on his leadership. He says, he says, hey man, you're wearing yourself out trying to do everything for the people of Israel. He says, there's no way you can sustain this. He said, you're trying to be their intercessor, their teacher, their judge. He said, there's no way you can do it. So you need to appoint able men that fear God, that, are, uh, that resist bribes to handle the smaller issues, to, uh, to judge the smaller issues. And if there's weightier issues or bigger issues, they can bring those to you, and you can be focusing on your spiritual duties. And, of course, we, we went through that, and we see how that happened. Um, and this would, what we talked about briefly would allow Moses to really focus more on his, I will use pastoral duties uh, in quotation marks, for Israel. Of course, he's obviously the prophet there as well and, and intercessor. So uh, Moses listens to this advice. We read in Deuteronomy 1, or we talked about Deuteronomy 1, and it goes back and shows how God kind of ordained it as well. We know the process of of dividing from the tribes and having people set over hundreds and fifties and tens. We'll get into that in great detail uh, as we go through the rest of the, the Torah. So that's kind of what chapter 18 was about. It was a shorter chapter, uh, but again, some great things in there as well. And so we're going to get right into chapter 19. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to read the entire chapter because we're going to go back through things. So I, I want us to be able to see the whole picture first. Then we'll go back and start picking it apart a little bit different from the way we've operated here recently. Um, but let's see, we are in Exodus, our 17th lesson of Exodus, our 68th lesson overall. But let's, we're going to talk about Mount Sinai. And I know this is probably like the most cheesy picture of Mount Sinai. But it's hard to find one, though, of, uh, you know, we'll talk about that in a minute. But, I mean, it's a neat picture, obviously. Uh, but, you know, if that's the way it looked, I'd probably tremble as well <laughs> if I was there. So, uh, but anyway, let's pray. Then we'll jump right into God's Word. And just trust the Lord to do some amazing things tonight. Lord, we thank you this evening. Lord, we can gather in your house. Lord, we're here to learn about you, to, to grow our faith in you through your word. Lord, and so we just ask that you would be with us tonight. Jesus, just speak to our heart. Holy Spirit, reveal things to us. Lord, we, we've come to, to see what you have in store, what you're, what you're speaking through your written word in the Old Testament, Lord, and how that applies to our lives today, Lord. So we look back because we know the Bible is given for reproof, for instruction, and so we just submit tonight, Lord, have your way in this Bible study, and we thank you in the name of Jesus, we pray, amen. All right, so we're going to read the entire chapter 19 real quick. It's 25 verses. I'll speed read it like those guys that talk about side effects on medicine on TV commercials, so we can get through it real quick. Uh, but we'll see, and then we'll go back and we'll start over. So I want us to just kind of get a, an overview first. So it says, on the third new moon after the people of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. They set out from Rephidim, we've talked about Rephidim the last few weeks, and came into the wilderness of Sinai, and they encamped in the wilderness. There Israel encamped before the mountain. While Moses went up to God, the Lord called to him out of the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the people of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. So Moses came and called to the elders of the people and set before them all these words that the Lord has commanded him. And all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken, 
we will do. And Moses reported the words of the people to the Lord. And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I'm coming to you in a thick cloud that the people may hear when I speak with you and may also believe you forever. When Moses told the words of the people to the Lord, the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow and let them wash their garments and be ready for the third day. For on the third day the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people and you shall set limits for the people all around saying, Take care not to go up into the mountain or touch the edge of it. Whoever touches the mountain shall be put to death. No hand shall touch him, but he shall be stoned or shot. Whether beast or man, he shall not live. When the trumpet sounds a long blast, they shall come up to the mountain. So Moses went down from the mountain to the people and consecrated the people, and they washed their garments. And and he said to the people, Be ready for the third day. Do not go near a woman. On the morning of the third day there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast so that all the people in the camp trembled. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God, and they took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it in fire. The smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln, and the whole mountain trembled greatly. And the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder. Moses spoke, and God answered him in thunder. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. And the Lord said to Moses, Go down and warn the people, lest they break through to the Lord to look, and many of them perish. Also, let the priests who come near to the Lord consecrate themselves, lest the Lord break out against them. And Moses said to the Lord, The people cannot come up to to Mount Sinai, for you yourself warned us, saying, Set limits around the mountain and consecrate it. And the Lord said to him, Go down and come up, bringing Aaron with you. But do not let the priests and the people break through to come up to the Lord, lest he break out against them. So Moses went down to the people and told them. All right, so I wanted to read that so we kind of have a, just a real quick run through and we'll go back and start dissecting this. And then we're going to be, uh, I don't know if, I don't, don't want to say we'll get through chapter 19 today. We're going to read all of it again in a way, but there's so much and it folds into chapter 20 as well um, that we'll be here for a while. So the beginning of, of chapter 19 tells us that Three months after the exodus from Egypt began, three new moons, the third new moon, and journeying through the wilderness, that Israel reaches this place called Mount Sinai, and then in, in the wilderness of Mount Sinai, and it's a place, of course, surrounding the mountain, okay, they're at the bottom of it, and we knew this previously, as we've said, to be Mount Horeb, which is where Moses went to when he went up to the mountain, he saw the burning bush, and the Lord spoke to him and told him, I'm the great I am, and all those things that God told him there about what he was going to do, and he was going to send Moses to deliver the people from Pharaoh. This is the same place that happened. So the Bible tells us on the third new moon, after the people of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, they came to the wilderness of Sinai. So we, uh, you often hear people say, and I say it too, that the journey through the wilderness was meant to be very short, okay? And so I, I don't want us to, there's two sides of that coin, I guess you'd say. There's the trip from Egypt to Sinai, and then from Sinai to the promised land was the very short part that was supposed to have been. Okay, that's where it got lengthened at. And that's what, that's what we're talking to when we said they lengthened that part of the journey. So to get here was three months, the third new moon. And they're here. Uh, and here's a, a map of the, this is in the back of your Bible if you have one of those Bibles with maps. Um, if I try to draw a red circle. It's, it's hard to find a color that sticks out on this map uh, very much. But Mount Sinai is believed uh, by several biblical scholars, to be in the southern Arabian Peninsula. So you can see that there. Um, there's, you, can, you, know, you can still go to uh, Mount Sinai today. I looked online. There's a, uh, a monastery there, near there. You can go and they take you up on top and you can hike it and all that good stuff if you'd like to. Uh, but it's still there and that's where most biblical scholars believe and the scripture points to it there in the southern Arabian Peninsula. But the, the people of Israel are going to be at Mount Sinai for 57 chapters of the Bible. Okay, and of course, you know, the Bible wasn't written in chapter, but there's a, that's a long time. Okay, that's, we've been moving through since Genesis, kind of just boom, 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 changing scenery and places. But from here in Exodus 19 till Numbers 10, we're going to be at Mount Sinai. So that's a long time. Okay, of course, the giving of the law is going to happen here at Mount Sinai. All 613 commandments in the law of Moses are going to be given here at Mount Sinai. And we're going to remember all of them, okay? I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm just kidding. But we're going to read all of them. But we're not going to remember all of them. Somebody says, I'm, I'm under Jesus. You know, I got those two laws. That's all I need to know, right? 
Love the Lord and love your neighbor. All right, so anyway, we're here. We're going we're gonna to see that happen. So it's, a, it's an important scripture or, or area of scripture to realize they're here for 57 chapters, okay? We'll talk about it in more depth eventually, not like right today, uh, but we've, and we've mentioned it previously some, I, or I have, but the giving of the law at Mount Sinai is commemorated, we'll read it in Leviticus, uh, with an annual feast that's called Shavuot, which we call Pentecost, right? It's a festival of weeks, uh, and of course it is, you count after, you're counting the Omer after Passover, we talked about that back when we started Passover, they're going a day, then they count 49 days, so on the 50th day, they were at Mount Sinai, this is where the law was given, so it is commemorated through an annual feast, Shavuot. And then when we go to the New Testament, at, in Acts chapter 2, all the people were in Jerusalem to celebrate Pentecost, right? To, to celebrate Shavuot, and that's where the Holy Spirit was poured out in the upper room. So there's no coincidence in that, okay? It was, that was by design of the Lord, and we'll talk about that later. Um, so we see that here as, as setting that up as well. It's the same day in history, different year, that the law was given to Moses at Mount Sinai that when in the New Testament that the upper room Holy Ghost experience happened, the baptism and the pouring out there. So before we move further into what happens at Mount Sinai, it'd be a really good time for us because we've talked a lot about this, this wilderness experience, but we've yet to define wilderness, okay? And, and so I'm not going to go into a huge, long uh, discussion of wilderness, because we're going to be in the wilderness for a while with the Israelites. And of course, we did the John Brevere study. Uh, and was, I know the book was called, Where Are You, God? I can't, was the study called something different? I feel like it was in my mind. I can't remember the name of it. But it's, God, do you remember what it was, Becky, the name of that study? But it was still, it was, it was a good, if you haven't read the book, Where Are You, God? Uh, I think it's what, I'm pretty sure it's the name of the book. Uh, read that. And John Brevere, there's one thing I, I remember from that uh, is John says that you can't shorten your wilderness stay, but you sure can lengthen your wilderness stay. So it's about obedience. It's about those, and we'll talk about that here uh, shortly. But if you look up in the, in the Hebrew text, the word for wilderness is this word in Hebrew called midbar. And like most words, it can have a couple of meanings, but when you look at what the uh, Jesenesis, I guess is how you say that, Hebrew Shaldi lexicon, this is what it says about Midbar. It's an uninhabited plain country fit for feeding flocks. Not desert, but a pasture. So that's probably a little bit different maybe than what you had in your mind when you think about the wilderness in the Middle East. Okay, now it, there are some instances where it can be kind of a, a sandy area, but for, by and large it's an uninhabited, it's an undeveloped area but it's where farmers are, are, you know, take their flock to feed. So think about that with your wilderness experience with the Lord. It's nothing negative, right? The wilderness is always a positive thing with the Lord. The Lord is going to take you from where you are to the wilderness, to a place that is fit for Him to feed you. It's pretty amazing, isn't it? So when you receive the manna in the wilderness, the daily bread, He's taking you from where you were, where distractions probably were. I don't know if, you've, if you've not been through a wilderness experience, it's coming your way eventually, okay? Just hang on. But if you have been through there, think about what you went through and how you were removed from, uh, from things that were distractions. Sometimes you feel like you were isolated, but you, when you really got down into it, it was just you and the Lord, right? That's when it happens, right? You were, you were taken away from outside influence so you could focus on God and you could feast on His manna, Jesus, the bread of life. So we see that happen and that's what we see when we read this word midbar. It's, it's a place that the flocks are fed. So I think it's an it's interesting thing to, to study and to learn and amazing how it changes kind of your perception, perception on the word wilderness. Now when Israel gets to Mount Sinai, it's really familiar territory for Moses. We said he was there before when the burning bush was there. There was, uh, there was no really direction needed for Moses to get back to Mount Sinai. But this is where he learned who the great I am is, right? This is where he learned who Yahweh is uh, at this very spot. He didn't have to wait to figure out what to do when he got to Mount Sinai. We read the Bible says that he went up to God. Verse 3, Moses went up to God. Okay, God didn't say come up here, but Moses got to the mountain and he went up because he knew up on this mountain is where I encountered the burning bush. I encountered Yahweh and I'm going back up there. Moses was warning the nation of Israel to experience exactly what he experienced at the burning bush, that encounter with the Lord, that personal encounter that changed his life. So the Bible goes on and says that he went up, the Lord called out to him from the mountain, 
and says, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob. So again, we're not calling the house of Israel, we're calling the house of Jacob. And tell the people of Israel, he says, Yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. He says, Now therefore, this is the Lord talking to Moses to speak to Israel. If you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. Moses is to go tell the people of Israel what God said. He's that, that mediator between God and man right now. And he's going to tell them, says, hey, God says, remember what I did for you. Okay, the Israelites saw with their own eyes what God did to Egypt. He saw what they have done, or what he has done so far through the wilderness, providing food and water, how they defeated the Amalekites, all that we've read. He says now, he says, I'm, the, he says, I'm real. I'm, God, I'm exactly the God who I said I would be. I, I am your God. He says now, if you will do two things. Obey my voice and keep my covenant. So the Lord is all about obedience. That's, that's what the Lord delights in, right? That's what the Lord is after, obedience. And when you obey, you, then you keep his covenant. Okay, that's kind of, those go two hand in hand together there. He says, if you obey my voice and keep my covenant, he says, you'll be my treasured possession among all peoples for the earth is mine. But he tells them there that he he bore them, God says, I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. So God pulled them out of Egypt. He pulled them out of 430 years of bondage. There was nothing that Israel could say that, look what we did. They didn't make the plagues fall on, on uh, Egypt. They didn't split the Red Sea. They didn't provide this. So God pulled them out and brought them to him. If we fast forward to Deuteronomy 32, the song of Moses in Deuteronomy, Moses is going to kind of recount this in respect to the eagle. I think it's just interesting to read. Um, it kind of just helps frame it for me at least. Um, it says here in Deuteronomy 32, 9, but the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is his allotted heritage. He found him in a desert land and in a howling waste of the wilderness. He encircled him. He cared for him. He kept him as the apple of his eye. Like an eagle that stirs up its nest, that flutters over its young, spreading out its wings, catching them, bearing them on its pinions, the Lord alone guided him. No foreign god was with him. So we're going back to Egypt, God destroyed the Egyptian gods. He, he laid waste to any false gods there were. And so Israel knew that God was the only God. But getting back to it, it says, God says, if, right? If there's a condition there. See, sometimes we, we don't like to think about the condition that we have to keep as the people of God. We don't like to read those if you do this, right? And so if we look at uh, just kind of in things in life in general, it says, if you will keep or obey my voice and keep my covenant, then, he says, I'll be your treasured possession among all peoples. Israel was already God's possession, right? God had already made that known to Abram and to Isaac and to Jacob. But he says, now you'll be my treasured possession, my most prized possession, right? My most valuable possession possession if you will just simply obey so think about how you treat your most prized possession you treat it different than other things right you don't just kind of just do whatever with it you take very good care of it to make sure that it's protected and all those things but God finishes out his word and says that if they keep it the covenant they obey that they wouldn't only be a treasured possession but they would be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation this is what the heart of God is for the people of Israel, and it's still his heart for us today. And we'll see that here in a minute. But a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. So it's a nation that's set apart by God, separated from the world for his use, right? To be holy is to be separated, to be set apart. And sometimes we get caught up into thinking, look what I did, look how holy I am. Okay, and, and don't do that, please, because you are not holy. None of us are. The Bible says, no, not one was, was righteous, right? So when we become holy or righteous, it's the Lord's work, okay? It's not what we have done. When we accept Christ into our heart, we accept, we also receive Christ's holiness, okay? So when God says, you be holy because I'm holy, he's giving us his holiness, all right? So this, this flesh can never be holy, right? That's the new creature, that's the new creation that we become. But let's look at this word priest in Hebrew. The word for priest is Kohen, is uh, K-O-H-E-N, Kohen. And it's really a compound word of two things. It means 
It's from the word kin, which we learned when we were in Israel, uh, which means yes. And then it's also this word kavun, which means to direct or to lead. And so if you look at the word priest, it is one who leads or directs someone to the truth of God. So they are leading someone to the yes, to the truth of God. They are directing them to that relationship that God is the only one and acceptance of his love. Now priests, we know, and we'll study more, have access to places that other people don't. And so we're already at Mount Sinai. There's already been, we've read, there's limits set, okay? And so the limits set at Mount Sinai are going to replicate the limits set in the tabernacle, and they're also going to replicate, replicate the limits set in the temple when we read. So there's almost three levels to read, or to, I guess we should say, uh, with Mount Sinai, and there's three levels at the tabernacle and the temple. So there's courts, right? We read those in the tabernacle and the temple. But the people are allowed to go to the edge of the mountain, right? They're allowed to go there, but they can't touch it because they're not allowed in. So in the tabernacle and the temple, the people are allowed into the, the outer courts. They can't go into the inside. Then you have the next, the inner courts, where the priests can go. They can, and then you have the Holy of Holies, which is where the high priest only can go inside the tabernacle and in the, in the temple as well. So we see that kind of already getting laid out, not in a horizontal sense, the tabernacle and the temple, but in a vertical sense with Mount Sinai. But the Lord says, I want you to be a kingdom of priests. So he says, I want you to go from the outer courts, where you can't come in, to the inner courts. Get that? And that's what God wants. I, want, I don't want you to have to be outside where if you touch the holiness, you're going to die. It says no man can touch you. You'll be stoned or shot with arrows, right? We're not talking about rifles and stuff back in the biblical times. In case somebody's thinking of uh, an Israelite with a Remington 770 or something like that. I don't know. But uh, but he says, I don't want you to be out there in the outer courts just wondering what's inside. Just separated from me. He says, no, but I want you to be a kingdom of priests that can come in to the inner court, that can commune with me. There'll still be a high priest, right? We know that's Jesus for us. But I want you to be on the inside, not separated from me, and you'll be a holy nation. Now, Pastor Rob was trying to steal my thunder a little bit this morning. He used one of my scripture, uh, but we'll let him slide with it because he preached so good. But we see that First Peter chapter 2, verse 9, when Peter is talking to the people in the New Testament of the new church, he says, uh, but you, just kidding, how did I do that? Okay, hit the wrong button. He says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood. A holy nation, right? He's quoting Exodus uh, 19.6. A people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into marvelous light. He's saying that's what you're supposed to be, a kingdom of priests. Now, the other thing that priests do, we say they bring people to God, is that, so we know individually priests have access to, to the inner courts, but the Lord wants the nation of Israel to be a priestly nation for the rest of the world. This is he wants us to be a priestly nation, not in the sense of the United States, but in the sense of the people of God as a nation to be able to spread the good news of Jesus Christ to the world. You see how he's got that ordained and set up that they are set apart, that when the world looks to the the kingdom of priests, they see the picture of God and they, they are drawn to that and they want that relationship with the Lord himself. So that's what we see set up there at this, this request. The Lord said, I want you to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Now the people, they're going to respond to God's call. And so Moses goes back down. He tells them what God's required, obedience. God always requires obedience. And so the church, we got to realize, and we get, that's why Deuteronomy is my favorite book, because it's about obedience and faith. But God only requires obedience through faith. <clears throat> you cannot obey without faith. It's not possible. You can't obey the Lord without faith. But the people here at Moses say, or says, and they say, great, we're going to do it. All right, they say, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. Famous last words, right? Now, we know from history that we don't always keep our word to the Lord. I mean, Israel doesn't always keep their word to the Lord. Sorry. Didn't mean to offend you there. But we don't always keep our word to the Lord. Now, sometimes we do that on purpose, with, with ill intention of never keeping it. Sometimes we, get, we just falter, right? But I won't make you raise your hands, but have you ever went back on your word sometimes? Right? I'd have to raise both and all ten toes and all that good stuff. But we know that the Lord does not do that, right? That is not what God is about. God never goes back on his word. 
That when God speaks it, that it will come to pass, that he will hold to his word. Isaiah 55, we read in verse 10, For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return there, but water, uh, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty or void, as the King James says, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose, and it shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. So when God speaks a word, it will not return void. It will not return empty. It will accomplish the purpose that he has sent it out for, and it will succeed. God tells Israel in Numbers 30 a command. Moses says to the heads of the tribe of the people of Israel, this is what the Lord has commanded. I just got verse 1. I apologize. I'll let me read you verse 2. If a man vows a vow to the, to the Lord or swears an oath to bind himself by a pledge, he shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceeds out of his mouth. And that's so simple, but sometimes so difficult to accomplish. Jesus even talks about oaths at the Sermon on the Mount. He says, if you heard that it said of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn, going back to the numbers, but I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it's the throne of God, by earth, it's his footstool, or by Jerusalem, it's the city of the great king, and do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. He says, let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more from this comes from evil. I think what Jesus is trying to get at is that your word should be good enough. Right? That when you say yes or no, there should be no extra stuff has to be added so we believe you. Or believe whoever, me included, right? It should just be yes or no, and we can go to the bank on it because God goes to his word and does not go back. And what God is trying to say is that I don't go back on my word, so if you're going to represent me, you can't go back on your word. We see that come into play, of course, throughout scriptures. Next, God tells Moses for the people to consecrate themselves. Now, I want you to think about our study on baptism as we read this scripture, because they're making themselves, they're going to cleanse themselves, make themselves clean. They're going to consecrate so they can come and approach. Verse 9 says, the Lord said to Moses, I'm coming to you in a thick cloud. We've talked about the pillar before. The people may hear when I speak with you and may also believe you forever. So God wants people to hear his voice to Moses, but yet believe Moses forever. And Moses told the words to the people. The Lord said to Moses, go to the people, consecrate them to, today and tomorrow. Let them wash their garments. Right? So there's going to be a cleansing of the garments. Right? So we can see that baptism kind of theme going on. And be ready for the third day. <clears throat> on the third day, the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. And you shall set limits for the people all around saying, take care. Do not go up into the mountain or touch it, <clears throat> which we talked about a minute ago, because you'll be put to death. No hand, uh, or, you know, no hand shall touch him, but he shall be stoned or shot, beast or man. And when the trumpet sounds a long blast, they shall come up to the mountain. So Moses went down. He consecrated the people. They washed their garments. And he said, also, don't go near a woman. I'm not going to talk about that, all right, because I'm married and I want to keep it that way. But I'm just going to tell you something about that, that he said, stay away, all right? So I'm just, it's scriptural. You can't get mad at me, all right? It's in there. So we're going to move on real quick because I feel Nikki's eyes like burning a hole through my head. But the people are going to consecrate themselves. They're going to come up to the mountain. They're not going to touch it. And God's going to speak to Moses from the cloud and then they're going to go to be submitted to him. They're going to be submitted to Moses, their high priest. And God says, when the trumpet sounds, a long blast, the people shall come up to the mountain. All right, here's, what, here's where this gets really interesting. Okay, so we're about to go deep, so put your life vest on, all right? It's, it's going to be, we're going to be treading some deep stuff here. Verse, uh, did I miss verse 16? All right, just trust me. I'm copying and pasting too quick this morning. On the morning of the third day, there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and very loud trumpet blast. So all the people in the, in the camp trembled. Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God. They took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Verse 18 says, Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended, descended on it in fire. The smoke of it went up like a, the smoke of a kiln. The whole mountain trembled greatly. Verse 19 says, The sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder. Moses spoke. God answered in thunder. The Lord came down. To the top of the mountain, the Lord called Moses to the top. Moses went up. The Lord spoke to him, said, go down. Moses probably get a little tired of walking up down this mountain, if we're being honest about it, okay? And getting the steps in. Go down and warn the people, lest they break through, consecrate themselves, right? And Moses said, you've already told us this. You've warned us, so we're going to do that. 
So let's look back. Mount Sinai is wrapped in smoke. It's wrapped in fire. It's trembling. There's this sound of a trumpet that grew louder and louder. Now, some, uh, most biblical scholars of the Old Testament, especially he- Hebrew or Jewish, will say that they saw tongues of fire here. Okay, because I'm going to tell you why they saw tongues of fire. But we see all these things happen, these blasts, these, this thunder, this fire, this smoke, all this lightning. I, I don't know how you describe this storm, if it's like a, uh, an earthquake and a, almost like a, some kind of volcano type thing and a hurricane all together, whatever you want to call it. But we see this going on and the mountains trembling greatly. But I want us to focus on verse 19. We're going to spend the next few minutes talking about verse 19. It says, The sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, and Moses spoke, and God answered him in thunder. So let's look at the King James, because it captures this pretty good uh, in one word, and we'll look at the TLV as well. The King James says, The voice of the trumpet sounded long. Okay, so we heard ESV say sound. King James says the voice of the trumpet. We look at the TLV, and it says the sound of the shofar grew louder and louder. So we have two things here. We have this word voice in the King James, and we have this word shofar in the TLV. So if we look back in the Hebrew, we in fact see that the word used for voice or for sound is the Hebrew word kol, and the word used for trumpet, as the TLV often does because it uses a lot of Hebrew names, is the word shofar. So I I brought a shofar. I don't know if I will blow it this evening or not. We'll see if the time's right uh, on camera because I'll probably get shy and mess it up. So I did buy this off Amazon from Israel, they said this week, right? I'm sure that's exactly where it came from. Uh, I'm sure it probably came, I don't know where it came from. So uh, anyway, I do have a shofar, so we all know this is just a a, a shorter one. They make larger ones. When we were in Israel, uh, you could pay a lot of money for a shofar if you wanted to. And I think we said this morning, 250 bucks is what we saw one go for, but they were wanting like 400 for it. Yeah, so uh, those things... I didn't know how I was going to get on the plane. It made me nervous if I had bought one, but uh, a couple of them just carried them on like it was nothing, I guess. So they make them with uh, silver and all kinds of metals and uh, designs on them and, and things over there. But we know that the shofar, and of course, we as a Pentecostal church are aware of the shofar. We've been in, in services you know, where we've seen the shofar blown. But here we read, this is the first time in the Bible the word shofar is used. But I want to go back to the word voice for a second, this word coal. Uh, if we look at the word coal, we see that it can be just defined as a voice or a sound, right? So that's why we read different things in different translations. But if we activate the law of first mention, so that's we go back to the first time this word is used in the Bible, we go all the way back to Genesis 3, 8, and it says, they heard the voice of the Lord walking, of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And of course, we know this is when Adam and Eve hid themselves because they were worried about what was going to happen because they broke the command of God. But they heard the voice of the Lord. So if we think about voice or sound, voices are specific. Sounds are generic. So I want you to think about when the Lord speaks, it is a specific sound. Now, we may not understand it if we're young in our faith. That's something we grow in through our devotion to Him, through our prayer and our fasting and our worship. And so we become in, we learn that voice because it may be a sound when we first hear it, but as we recognize it to be a voice, it is specific. Here the, the word that we see used in the Greek is the word phone, right? And so that's where we get the word telephone from. So think about that. So if you speak to someone on a telephone, it provides clarity of sound or voice. So I want just kind of something to, to think about there as well. So how do you think the Lord wants to speak to you? Through a voice? Or through a sound, right? He wants to speak through a voice. Of course, we know that he speaks through a small, still small voice. But we see here that he was, the voice of the Lord was in the garden. We know in Exodus 19 we're reading, the voice of the trumpet was loud, right? It was, a, it was trembling. It grew louder and louder. So we see the Lord can speak in different ways. The shofar is well documented as well. We know that's to be a, a it can also, um, we see it used as trumpet. It can be a horn. But it's specifically a ram's horn. So in Exodus 19, 19, we see God sounding the ram's horn, the shofar. That's what he blew as a trumpet. And he's speaking through the ram's horn. Now, I want us, this is where we're getting deeper. I want us to think about what we know about the ram's horn. The ram's horn, the shofar, is, can be described as or is equivalent to the prophetic voice of God. You say, well, how is that possible? Okay, how, how do you get all that? From the shofar. Well, let's go back to the first time that we read about 
a ram's horn in Genesis. Okay, we read in Genesis 22 that Isaac was taken by Abraham to be sacrificed, right? He took his only son, the one that he loved, up on Mount Moriah to kill him, to sacrifice him. But the angel called out. Of course, Isaac asked, where's the lamb? And God, he said, Abraham said, God will provide the lamb. That's where we get Jehovah Jireh from. But he was about to sacrifice his son, and the angel called out and said, Abraham, Abraham. He says, don't lay your hand on the boy or anything to him, for I now know that you fear God, and seeing you've not withheld your son. He said, he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. So the horn of the ram signifies the substitute sacrifice the Lord will provide so we can see there's a prophetic meaning in the shofar and the ram's horn as the prophetic voice of God, right? We know that Jesus is that substitute sacrifice for us. We talked about it in great detail when we studied through Genesis 22. So I want us to get that as well. All right, the next thing I want us to get, because we're going to tie three things together. So we've got a voice that speaks. We've got a trumpet, which is a shofar, which is a ram's horn, which is the prophetic voice of God. But we still need one more thing to make the sound of the trumpet. And what is it? How do you sound a trumpet? A blow, right? Need breath, right? Need breath, exactly right. So let's read what the breath of God does. We go all the way back to Genesis chapter 2. It says that when God formed the man from the dust of the earth, he breathed into the nostrils the breath of life. Now the word used for breath in both Hebrew and Greek is the same word that's used for wind and for spirit. All three words, one word, right? The Ruach, right? The Ruach HaKodesh in Hebrew is the Holy Spirit. So it's the same word. So we can see that the Holy Spirit is the breath of God. So when God sounds the trumpet, His voice, He breathes His Spirit through His prophetic voice of the shofar, that we've got to take note of something amazing that's happening. So we see that first done here in Exodus 19. It's a sign, right? It's a, it's a they, the people, the Hebrew people, the Jewish people to this day, they still blow the shofar. Of course, we do as well more in a praise and worship setting. But they're commanded, and we're going to read the commandments to, that they do that. But when they sound the shofar, because when they hear the prophetic voice of God, it's a reminder that God's word will not fail. That what God said he would do, he would do. So we're going to read of one here in a minute. But when they hear the shofar, now there's other uses for the shofar. There, it's, there's battle cries. There's, but think about what happened at Jericho, okay? At Jericho, they marched around the wall six days. On the seventh day, they were very quiet, right? But then they blew the trumpet, the voice of God. Then they shouted the praises and worship. Then the walls fell down. See the power that's in the voice of God through the shofar, through the prophetic. So that's where it comes into. So that when they hear the, the shofar, the people know, the, peop, the Jewish people, the people of Israel here in the Old Testament, they know that's a sign, it's encouragement, it's a reminder of the covenant and the promise that God would, would keep His Word. All right, so let's go now and, and look. This is because I want us to, to kind of land this, and we'll continue on with Exodus 19 later. But I want us to think about this and what it means. There's also another word uh, that can be used, and we, we read it actually previously in Exodus 19. I just didn't pull it out for you. Uh, but in Exodus 19, verse... Verse was it? He said trumpet, but it wasn't 19. It was uh, verse 13. It says, When a trumpet sounds, the word used for that is yobel, right? Like yobel. So that means a, it's a similar, it's a synonym for a ram's horn, but it also could be a metallic, like a trumpet, like a cornet. But we see that as well. So I want us now to go to Leviticus. Oh man, you mean Leviticus, that crazy book? Yeah, that book. Right? How could something amazing be there? Well, let's look and see what the command of God in Leviticus says. Now, this is a, a command about keeping the years. And this is, we're going to talk about the year of Jubilee in Leviticus 25. The year of Jubilee is marked by the blowing of the trumpet. I want you to know that going in. That it's marked by the blowing of the trumpet. That's how you signify it. The Bible tells us that during the, the year of Jubilee... The word used for jubilee is also yavel, the same as a trumpet. So you think about high yavel is a harvest. It's also a play off that. Uh, another name for that trumpet and ram's horn. But it, the purpose of sounding the 
trumpet in the year of Jubilee is to declare liberty to the people. So let me tell you, the voice of God declares liberty to the people. Think about that. That makes my, like, the hair stand up on the back of my neck. Right? The, the voice of God declares liberty to the people. So Leviticus 25 tells us, You shall count seven weeks of years. Seven times seven years. So that on the seventh weeks of the seven weeks of years shall give you 49 years. So we've got a time period of 49 years. Then you shall sound the loud trumpet on the tenth day of the seventh month on the day of, of atonement. That's Yom Kippur, the day of atonement. You shall sound the trumpet throughout all your land. And you shall consecrate the fiftieth year and proclaim liberty throughout the land to all its inhabitants. So the sounding of the trumpet in the year of Jubilee is to declare liberty to all the inhabitants. And it shall be a Jubilee for you, a, a Yavel, and each of you shall return to his property, and each shall return to his clan. So in the year of Jubilee, you get to go home. You get to return back to your land, to your clan. doesn't matter where you've been, how you've been held or whatever, but if you've been an indentured servant or slave, whatever you want to call it, the year of Jubilee, when the, when the voice of God sounds, you get to go home. It's liberty. Isn't that amazing? That when, so think about in our own lives, right? When we accept Christ, there's a trumpet sound. We're going back home, okay? And, so, and I, we'll talk about that more in the future, but it's a jubilee, and we see it here. <clears throat> Do you know in our own, and I don't typically get too involved in American history with, with biblical history because I don't want us to think that we're God's people because we're not, okay? And then we, as Americans, sometimes we have a way to form it that way. Like it was the book of George Washington or something like that, and it's not, okay? I just, just, just so we're clear. But do you know what's written on the Liberty Bell? Proclaim liberty throughout all the land until all the inhabitants thereof. To the founding fathers of this nation knew this was a land of liberty. It was based in the Word of God. That that bell, when it sounded, it's not a trumpet, it's a bell. But when it sounded, it was a jubilee. That this land was a land of freedom. Okay? It's, it's, that's what they had in their mind when they founded this country. They did not have in mind what we have today. Farthest thing from it. Okay? They're probably spinning like crazy in their graves. But this is what they had in mind. To proclaim liberty throughout all the land to all the inhabitants. They're quoting Leviticus 25 because it's a jubilee. It's a yavel. And I want to go a little bit further, and I don't have this uh, up there, but I, but I forgot to put it in my slides. The word for shofar, it's a play on another Hebrew word, and I, I can't remember exactly how to say it, uh, but it means this. It means an, an, it's like an uphill against all odds battle is where it comes from. So when, you, when the, the shofar is blown, it's like you're going against an uphill, never-ending battle, but the Lord provides, Amen. amen. He's our banner. He's Jehovah Nissi. He provides liberty. He provides that. And so that even became part of the, of the slogan of the abolitionist movement to end slavery in the U.S. This scripture, that original Hebrew, it was all brought together to provide liberty to the inhabitants of the land thereof. So we see the shofar. And that's where we're going to kind of to stop it tonight before we move anything else. But we see there in Exodus 19.19 19, that when God blew the trumpet, it wasn't just blowing the trumpet. It wasn't just some sound. It was his voice, his spirit, and prophetically saying, I'm providing liberty. I'm going to keep my word, my covenant. You're going to know it. I'm drawing you close. Now, we're going to read what the nation of Israel did next week, and that's going to be they got scared. They trembled. Even Moses trembled, Hebrews tells us. But God had so, I, just, I think it's the, one of the most missed things in biblical history that, they, that God had in store for them to be with them, to not be separated on the outer courts, but to be with him as a kingdom of priests. And they got scared of the voice of God. See, sometimes we get scared of the voice of God. Right? Sometimes we get worried, we get tremble, and we get, because sometimes the voice of God says what we don't want to hear. And sometimes the voice of God is foreign to us, right? If we're not tuned in and we're not plugged in, and we don't know what it is. So I want us to think about all those things as we move forward, and we're going to read next week about what the nation of Israel did. We're going to read about the ten words. I'm not going to call them the ten commandments. The ten words. I'm going to go Hebrew on you. And we'll talk about what that means, the Decalogue as well. 
Um, but we're going to get all of that going and see where it unpacks. So I want to leave us some time. Uh, we've got 13 minutes till ladies' prayer begins. So if there's any questions or discussion about the shofar or the, the voice of God, kingdom of priests, what Peter said in the New Testament, anything, nothing? Just like deer in a headlight. All right. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it came from the mountain, right? It didn't come from the people. Yeah. Yeah. You want jeez, man. I practiced it, and they heard me earlier, so I know I can. I'm going to turn this mic off. That probably would be good with it. Yeah. Got the Holy Spirit on the inside of me, see? Is that what that means, right? I don't know. It's, it made me feel good. But yeah, so that's, that's true, though. that's what we read, that, it's, that it wasn't the people that blew it, it, was, it came from the mountain, the trumpet blast did. Anything else? What else? What else? I thought Wes was raising his hand, scratching something back there. Nothing? Mike, anything? Not that I can formulate. Not you can formulate. <laughs> okay, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end before he does then, because <laughs> if he's thinking that hard, it makes me worried. All right, let's go ahead and dismiss in a word of prayer. I, and it, probably something you've, again, you've not thought about or seen in that, in that scripture. Uh, Exodus 19 to me is, like I said, one of the most missed, but it's one of the most intriguing scriptures in the Old Testament. And we'll see what happens in 20 as well. Uh, but, I mean, just amazing. It was a test to see if Israel was going to trust the Lord right there. I mean, it was, a, it was like a make or break moment almost. And, um, and we see what happened. We'll read what happens as we go forward. So, uh, go get you a shofar online at Amazon from Israel, and, and you can uh, try to blow that at your house. And the kids were trying to blow it earlier, and Nikki as well. <clears throat> I won't make fun of her for her attempt at it. But uh, Silas, he did the best. He just put his mouth to it and went, woo, <laughs> made, his, made his own toot through it. So he got it figured out. <clears throat> He's pretty smart about it. So, but let's just miss in a word of prayer tonight. And... Uh, we are uh, just blessed and excited about what the Lord has in store. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you, God, for your prophetic voice. Lord, we thank you for your spirit. Lord, we thank you that your voice means liberty, that you are setting the captives free, that the, whoever the Son has set free is free indeed. So we declare that tonight. We believe it. Lord we, just, Lord, we just love you and we thank you for that. God, that you have nothing but great things in store for us. We thank you for your word. Lord, and we're excited about where you're going to take us next. Holy Spirit, just witness to us, Lord, this week as we go out through our week. Lord, speak to us. Lord, bring things to our, Lord, that would convict us, that would stir us, that would flame the fire or fan the fire and grow that flame that we have for you. Lord, we want to be all in for you. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Thank you all. Ladies, prayer right now. And uh, guys, we'll step aside.